Uh, welcome, thank you for being here. My name is Allison Nyhart. I'm with the Food Systems Initiative here at UVM, which supports transdisciplinary <coughs> research, scholarship, teaching, and outreach on food systems. And we're delighted to be co-sponsoring this event today with the Clean Energy Fund. Um, this is the third seminar in a series of four seminars focused on campus food and energy systems. It's, as I mentioned, organized by the Food Systems Initiative and funded by the Clean Energy Fund, which is a self-imposed student fee of $10 that supports clean energy projects and educational opportunities at UVM. Um, so just a little bit of the background on the impetus for organizing this series. Um, we sort of visioned this as an opportunity for the UVM community to, um, to learn together and uh, inspire thought about uh, food and energy sustainability initiatives on our campus. Um, in order to make responsible choices, you know, we understand that we need a common understanding of the potential synergies and trade-offs among the various sustainability opportunities and initiatives before us. Um, it's also a timely event series because, the, as many of you probably know, the campus is going through uh, a, an RFP process for our dining service provider that would, um, the current contract will end in June of 2014, or of June of 2015. And so um, we just think that this is a great opportunity for the UVM community to set a vision for what we want our campus food system to be. Um, so following Helene's talk, we're going to have about a 40 minute presentation from her and then we'll have some time for Q&A and, &A, and that time will be um, a good opportunity for us to dig into some more of the kind of gritty questions and um, there's going to be someone taking notes and capturing the discussion. Um, our plan is to capture what we've heard through all of these seminars in a report that we're going to share with the Clean Energy Fund and with the RFP committee. Um, so the first seminar we had in this series uh, was from Eric Garza, who's actually sitting here today. Um, and Eric Garza took us into the world of the food, um, the, the energy intensity of food. I think one of the most interesting stats that came out of that lecture for me was this estimate that it takes maybe somewhere in the realm of 15 to 20 calories of energy to produce one calorie of food. So we know that food is very energy intensive. The the second seminar series looked at what are the climate impacts of food and how can different tracking systems help us make sustainability decisions at an institutional level. Um, so uh, I would just mention that I'll, although I know Helene's talk today is going to address some energy and climate issues, she's also going to be addressing sustainability more generally. So um, I am really pleased to be able to introduce Helene York today. Um, Helene has worked for uh, Bon Appetit in a variety of positions for the last several years, and um, she's spearheaded some really innovative sustainability initiatives in her work. Uh, in 2005, she was instrumental in getting uh, the Compass Group to adopt a strong national sustainable seafood procurement policy. She also designed in 2007 the Low Carbon Diet Program, which was one of the first national programs to emphasize the significant connections between food and climate change. Um, she's also been instrumental in supporting the development of some sustainable supply change, chains. Um, for example, she worked on finding a market for the, the trim that is otherwise flushed to the sea as a waste product in salmon processing. She also worked on a fair trade certified chocolate supply chain that certifies it not only in the source but also at the processing stage. And she's worked with the um, fresh winter tomatoes market for um, with the coalition of Immokalee workers and the code of conduct that has been signed with them. Um, for the past 18 months, she's been the Director of Procurement and Responsible Business at Google, and um, she's there now, and I'm very delighted to turn it over to Helene. Thank you, Allison. 
Um, I have to say that I'm usually invited to speak when p sponsors want two things. When they want a real world perspective on supply chain issues, because I'm very much in the trenches and have been for about 10 years. Um, and also when they want a little bit of controversy. And um, I promise you I'm going to give you both today. Um, I hope that's what you're looking for. Um, so, uh, I, and, you know, I'm just going to add one more thing to my bio. I want you to know that I've worked closely with the Real Food Challenge for a number of years. And when I was director of procurement strategy or purchasing strategy for Bon Appetit Management Company, I wrote a booklet for students at Bon Appetit colleges around the United States on like how to make sense of the supply chain and how to actually count real food and other food um, and, and to, to really try to demystify that. So um, I'm very familiar with a lot of the goals of that program. Let's talk a little bit about campus food. Um, you know, when, when the people that I mostly talk to, the people who are really interested in food systems and food, these are the kind of values um, that they're looking for. Unfortunately, this is what most college students um, are interested in eating. And it is a big conflict um, as a general rule, especially if you don't speak the same language. And I think that that is where a lot of student activists get into a little bit of of trouble, and my hope today is that I talk a little bit about how to bridge uh, that gap. So I have a short agenda today, but mostly I want to talk about um, raising the question of what are we trying to achieve. Um, obviously, nourishment um, that students and their parents pay for is important, but we all know it's not the only thing. What are we trying to achieve in a socially and environmentally responsible procurement policy? I also want to discuss the unhappy contradictions that come up in a supply chain work. The kinds of things we don't want to admit sometimes are there, and the kinds of things when you look deeply beyond labels, you see, and you say, how can I promote this when it uh, has a negative effect on another important value? So I'm, I want to bring these up to you because I know you all care, or you wouldn't be spending you know, 3.30 in the afternoon with me. And so um, if you're not aware of some of these contradictions, uh, perhaps this is a beginning food for thought. Let's talk a little bit about the big picture issues. Obviously, the two earlier seminars talked about some of them, but I'm going to briefly review them and then talk about an you know, alternative approach to thinking about what we mean by responsible procurement. So getting to that first question, what are we trying to achieve? One of the things that has really come to bother me over the years as I hear from suppliers and prospective suppliers every day. I mean, I literally get boxes of samples sent to me every single day. And the most common uh, marketing tool on prepackaged items or through a contracted meat supplier or seafood supplier is the following phrase. Our, this is a sustainable product. And I have to tell you, it has made me nuts. Um, because I don't know what a sustainable product is, and I certainly don't trust a product manufacturer to know what a sustainable product is. But I do think that we sometimes fall uh, guilty um, in referring to sustainable food, sustainable farms, and of course sustainable products. And I think our emphasis there is really misplaced. I would like to suggest that what we need to think about and really concentrate on is what is contributing to a sustainable food system. And let me tell you, you my bias, I don't think we're close to having a sustainable food system now, and I don't think we have enough of a vision yet, but that's why I'm so happy to see so many people in this room. This has become so much more important a topic on college campuses than it was when I started this work. But where are we going? How, what do we have to do to get to a sustainable food system by 2030 or some other date beyond that. So what do we actually mean by a sustainable food system?
Well, when I think of it, first of all, it really concerns how we grow food, how we deliver food products, um, how we prepare meals, the food that pe people actually eat, um, and how we feed people. And what I really mean, of course, is you all know this, about a billion people in the world are underfed and about a billion people are overfed. That distribution, that allocation is critically important to a definition of a sustainable food system. However, when we talk about a sustainable product or farm or sustainable food, we're really only talking about one part of that chain. And, and you may disagree in the way I framed it, but I want to put that out there as a way to think about what are we talking about and the difference between a product or a farm and a whole system. All of these elements need to be in balance for us to think about what a sustainable food system is. So, you know, there are a pile of attributes that, I don't know about you, but I find all of these important, and I'll be very honest, I took this straight off the page of the Real Food Challenge. I think many of us really agree these are important attributes. Local or community-based, others use the term regional food shed, ecologically sound, responsible use of natural resources, and humane. By the way, for three years I was on the board of Certified Humane, the only non-meat eater on the board but I'm very familiar with the certification programs in um, uh meat as, as well as seafood. Um, these, all of these matter, but unfortunately, some of these values conflict. Which ones are actually most dear to us? And what about affordable, especially for the people who grow our food and for the people who work in the kitchens preparing the food that we eat? What about healthy or safe food? You know, in the United States, as much as we talk about concerns about pesticides or other elements that are put into processing our food, we have a much safer food system than the half of the world's population has access to. But healthy certainly is an issue that with uh, two-thirds of the U.S. population grossly overweight or obese, I think we have to question um, where we are on that as well. And I put the word appealing up there. It's often thought of as kind of a luxury item. But go, think back to that first slide where I identified those circles of values and then the three big ones that most students tend to think about. If we're going to have a chance of persuading our colleagues who are much more interested in chemistry or video games or math or whatever other things jazz um, our friends and our colleagues, we have to make the food appealing. That is not an insignificant factor. So what we've come uh, up against in the last couple years, and I have to say I've been involved in this, and I think there are a lot of incredibly well-intentioned efforts involved in creating procurement strategies that, if you think about it, are actually an accretion of commitments. Here are the kinds of commitments that you see from those who are really trying to do the right thing, and I've listened some of the questions after these things. Um, you know, if you're talking about cage-free eggs, what happens if suppliers merge and all of a sudden your cage-free eggs are no longer cage-free? Yes, that has happened. What about humane meat? Some people think that's an oxymoron. Green-listed seafood species. What about the 87% of seafood that isn't green-listed? What do we do about that? Is, do we have a responsibility of just buying the green listed or somehow working with the red listing, listed and improving it? And then small farm products. If you want to make a commitment of a percentage, are you talking about by weight or by dollars? You can come to really, really different numbers if you choose different things. Here's, here's my concern about the commitments. First of all, this was a great way to start. When we were deciding what were the values that mattered to us, 
we thought, well, we're going to make a commitment to X or to Y or to Z. That's a great place to start. But I think that as we've discovered a lot of our values, as we've begun to see that some of them conflict, this strategy isn't as forward thinking as I think we're going to need. I think it's also time for a more comprehensive approach. One of the concerns that I have about the accretion of commitments approach is that when you check one box, you are effectively unchecking another one. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. But we don't tally the unchecks. And that's where I think we need to be a little bit more honest with ourselves. So I believe that an accretion of commitments, though incredibly well-intentioned, will not actually lead to a sustainable food system. It's a classic forest of a trees problem. It also takes away our opportunity sometimes to make a difference on a broader scale in those food production systems that actually feed most of the people in the world, as opposed to those of us who have access to better quality food because we have more money. I'm also concerned about the value of ecologically sound. Hugely important, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We have to have ecologically sound food. We have to move in a direction of having uh, production systems that are more ecologically sound. But unfortunately, sometimes this term is code for and allows us to check off that box where we're actually negating another value and creating lower yields and more extensification, which is exactly what we cannot afford as a global community. And then, as I've already said, this embodies contradictory values, even though we don't always uh, acknowledge the trade-offs. So let's consider some of these contradictions that I've talked about. And let me also say that all of these examples I have personally visited, and I've even smelled them. Okay, chicken production systems, if you've ever been to, not the best smelling operations. Um, uh, anyway, I want to I talk about some real ones. Let's talk about a very responsible chicken producer in Ohio. Um, they distribute in 13 states all uh, surrounding them. Um, their sales are less than $100 million, which puts them in the category of less than 1% of the industry leaders. So I know that that's actually a term that I came up with when I coined a, a phrase of midterm uh, responsible producers. These are not the big guys who are really making the markets. These are guys trying to compete. They have exemplary relationships with contract growers. What do I mean by that? Maybe you know this, maybe some of you know this and others don't. Almost none of the chicken producers in this country, broiler chickens, own their means of productions. They contract with family farms. Even the biggest names that you know and the biggest names that you don't know, and there are 10 companies that control 86% of the chicken production in the United States, they do not own their own means of, con of production. They're almost entirely family farms. Yes, they have large barns, but they are contract farmers, regionally organized. And um, some have excellent con uh, relations with their contract growers, and some do not. These people absolutely do. Um, they saw a change in their labor uh, pool um, and um, had bad relations with their processing workers. So these are not the people who grow the chickens. These are the people doing the slaughtering, doing the processing and, and packaging and so forth. They built relationships with their employees that are the best I have seen anywhere in the meat production system. And they even agreed to embark on a two-year program, we didn't think it was going to be two years, but it became two years, to meet certified humane standards of animal welfare in the barns. They did a fantastic job. They really looked at the standards, they made changes. But when they were called out for substandard conditions in their slaughterhouse for the birds, I'm not talking about anything else, 
just at the point. They even, you know, transported the birds not that far. But their slaughter system is a disaster from an animal welfare standpoint. I have never seen worse. They said, we're not going to spend $350 million. Why not? They were afraid that any of the certifications that we were asking them to look at um, would nullify their giant capital investment. We were not a big enough player. And let me tell you, we buy an awful lot of chicken. But we represented only 3% of their sales. And they said no. And all of our clients, almost all of our clients in the region that would be served, we even expanded the area where we would get chicken. We, we got another distributor so that we could send it to many more campuses. Most of them were college campuses who really valued animal welfare. They said no. They had had lots of experiences with some nonprofits, and they said, uh-uh, because if they change the criteria, then we're going to have to give back that label. Can't do it. So here you have, on one hand, a regional producer trying to keep up with the big guys, not part of that 86. Great relations with their contract growers, Great relations with their labor, highest retention rate of employees I've ever seen in an animal processing plant. And they refused to get certified, even though we held their hands for two years. They didn't do it. Okay, let me give you another example, and I'm sorry to pick on chicken, but sometimes I, when I go to sleep, I like smell chicken processing facilities. <laughs> I've been to way too many of them. And that's not why I don't eat meat, by the way. <laughs> but it certainly helps reinforce it. Um, so this particular responsible producer in California, um, a channel through um, Whole Foods Market. Now, Whole Foods has an animal welfare standard. They set up their own nonprofit, Global Animal Partnership, um, and they, their uh, birds, their, process, their whole production system already met step three out of one through five. Step three is about equal to certified humane. It's a very responsible level, and they did some things that were just terrific. But because they knew that there was a cadre of, of uh, consumers who really wanted better, wanted to have the highest animal welfare, they decided, let's go after step four. The problem with step four is that the birds would be fed 25% more feed to reach the same market weight over a longer period of time. And the reason is you grow them out slower, and so you don't have the potential respiratory issues in the last few days of life in chicken production that you do if you get them to this market weight, around six pounds, by the end of 47 days. The problem is 25% more feed equals 25% more land resources, including fertilizers, pesticides, transportation, emissions, um, and so forth. And so what you really have is a higher animal welfare standard and a lower environmental standard, a lower ecologically sound criteria. Um, very concerning to me, because here are two values that I hold very high. What do you do? Okay. Is it important to have the higher standard um, if the environmental costs for the same weight? That's, I think, a value judgment. I have my own opinions. You will probably have a variety of opinions in this room. But these are the kind of trade-offs you have to know you're making and be aware of it and then come to a values judgment yourself. My uh, third example, um, green-listed sockeye salmon. Um, we, uh, Allison brought this up. 
So we worked with a, a fisherman-owned company that hauls in and processes um, a significant share of the annual Copper River sockeye. Um, in noticing the production uh, facility, I noticed a lot of scrape, um, which is the meat off the skeletal bones. Um, and I said, I love that. I mean, that is green-listed wild sockeye salmon, and you're just like grinding it up and sending it out to sea? That's crazy. You know, we can make salmon pad thai out of that. We can make uh, salmon burgers. I mean, our chefs would just love and love to, to work with that. They said, sure. We developed a product together, they packaged it there, they barged it to us. I mean, about as responsible a supply chain as you can get. This was waste in the product um, uh, supply chain, and then it was as, as efficiently sent to us as possible. But then the immigration laws changed, and their processors changed, the people they hired in their facilities. And so in, they shifted production overseas to save money. And when they sent the product to us, it had actually gone all the way to Guangdong, China, and come back to the west coast of the United States, adding 10,000 nautical miles. Same price. Now, so the question is, should this sockeye scrape still qualify as a green listed product? I think that's a very interesting question. My last example, um, we were looking at carrot producers. This is a very recent example. We had a choice to buy from three carrot producers, a conventional lar large farm. This is California, um, largest producer of carrots in the United States. Um, an organic large farm, and then a small diversified large local organic farm 50 miles away. Now, three years ago, if uh, I had been given this um, threesome, it would have been a no-brainer. Of course, the last one. I want to support the local economy. I want to support a diversified grower um, and, and so forth. And my second choice would have been the organic guys uh, far away. So I visited each one of the farms because I didn't know anything about carrot production. And I had read some things that suggested maybe this isn't as clear-cut a choice as it seems from the beginning. So here are some of the facts. The large-scale conventional and organic farms are 10 miles apart. They share the same soil, water, and air, and are operated by the same owner. Both use the same seeds. That surprised me. I assumed there were organic seeds and there were conventional seeds. No. The same water usage, meaning um, water feet, same quantity. Both rotate cover crops, even the conventional. Both use no large-scale pesticides applications. Both harvest and process with the same equipment, staff, and processing equipment. The organic insecticide isn't very effective. Low-wage earners are hired to pick weeds, which suck up some of the nutrients, suggesting maybe there's a slight difference in health issues, but I'll admit that doesn't matter as much to me. The yield on the organic crops is 18 to 30 tons per, per acre per harvest. There are two harvests a year. 18 to 30. Big variation there. And on the conventional farm, it's 40 tons per acre. The yield on the small local organic farm is two tons per acre. And the costs are pretty much commensurate with yield. And when I say two tons, I don't mean spread over the entire diversified farm. I just mean that devoted to carrots. So my question really is, which system best exemplifies ecologically sound or responsible? I'm not sure of the answer anymore. But I think that there could be more than one answer to that question. By the way, the, that's an organic carrot from the large scale farm and you can see it's a little bit harder for folks in f food service to actually work with it. That's pretty typical with the way they look. Delicious, but a little harder to work with. 
Okay. So, you know what? Uh, as a general rule, I have to say I think organic first. I think local, then I think organic, and then I think conventional. Um, and um, a friend of mine, a very distinguished uh, professor at um, UC Berkeley, was recently profiled in The Nation in an article by Sarah Frankel. Um, this literally is like a week or two old. Um, and she was looking at, she's had a 10-year study in the Salinas Valley, which is the salad bowl of the nation. I am sure you are eating some product here in Vermont from there, especially lettuces. And she is finding some very disturbing things about uh, pesticides and the health of small children of farm workers. And this probably wouldn't surprise any of you that there is, seems to be a connection here. But here is somebody who's so committed to the health of farm workers, and her comment was, the most important thing is that people have healthy food and enough of it. That means ample fruits and vegetables conventionally grown or organic. In the scheme of things, diet and quality of diet is more important to me than getting rid of those pesticides. I thought that was remarkable, but I, about how food is presented and how it is wasted. Um, but those of us who've been involved for a long time in trying to push the envelope on that and see some real limitations in getting to a zero waste situation or anything close to that in affluent areas. We also see a concern um, when we say, assuming no demand for animal, uh, a significant rise in demand for animal protein, um, that that is highly unlikely to happen as well. But I think of all of these things that really sort of blow me away, the fact that 75% of the arable land on the planet is devoted to ag animal agriculture is remarkable, whether it's feed, whether it's grazing. And many, many more of those acres are actually devoted to grazing than feed. We think about the corn feeding system in the United States, but globally it's very much the res reversed. About one-tenth of the land is used for feed and about 90% for grazing. Um, very wonderful uh, researcher Nathan Pelletier published a lot of interesting life cycle assessments. He made the comment a couple of years ago, we were sitting on a panel together and I wrote it down and I found it in the literature. In order to be at the same unsustainable level we are now in the food system, we will have to cut global livestock consumption in half by 2050. And you know what, it's really not fair to ask the Chinese to do that since they've had so little meat if we're not willing to do that ourselves. Uh, Jonathan Foley of the University of Minnesota um, in a very interesting article um, among many that he's published in Nature um, really was talking about an issue that goes back to the carrots um, example that I used. Um, he will say that he's for intensification but in a selective way and in a biologically important way. But what we have to do is close the yield gaps. That two tons per acre of carrots, carrots, something that's really fundamental to the health of children and to adults and other products, really two tons per acre, not good. 40 tons per acre might not be good either, but somewhere in there with less, uh, in, with more intensification of land, but less intensification of all the synthetic um, uh, inputs, um, that there are a number of things we can do. So now, many minutes into this, let's get to the heart, not the meat, of um, what I'm here to talk about, an alternative approach to institutional food procurement. It is no accident that I have a lot of color on that page, and I think you'll see what I mean going forward. My feeling very strongly, having visited literally over a hundred colleges in the United States and talking at many, many forums, is that we have to start with the plate, a culinary and nutritional 
focus. We have to get to the hearts of people we are trying to persuade. What do we want people to eat 80% of the time, not 20% of the time? And the questions fundamentally as we develop a strategy is, what can we accomplish now? What will take years to phase in? Because let's face it, you can't change things overnight. You want a good example of that? Look at the LA, Los Angeles Unified School District attempt um, after Jamie Oliver showed up to like completely change everything. Guess what? They've all gone back because it was rejected, because they didn't do it as thoughtfully as they should have. Not to blame them, just to use that as an example. And what are our stretch goals? So, really, I have a set of questions for you to answer, for you to think about. What if vegetables were integrated into every meal, not as a mere side dish or as an afterthought only for vegetarians? What if meat and cheese were used as garnishes? not as the center of the plate, um, or as pre-portioned small plates. I think I didn't write that question very well, um, but I think you know what I mean. That's really two separate questions. This is an example of a scallops dish. There was about uh, two ounces of scallops and about four ounces of spinach and some wonderful mushrooms that was just completely scooped up by everyone who saw it because it looked appealing, and it was. What if we learned from other cultures and redefined the term vegetarian to be about vegetables rather than about processed soy proteins? And what if we offered roasted vegetables at all meals instead of a cold salad bar for lunch and only potatoes for breakfast? Uh, those waffles, by the way, are made of lentils. Um, those are roasted brust caramel Brussels sprouts, no extra sugar, you just roast them and the flavor comes out. And a very interesting take on a burger um, that involves um, uh, cornmeal and mushrooms. And you can see the color is pretty spectacular. What if we introduce new flavors to our eaters, including lower trophic proteins um, species, such as clams and mussels, which are the most sustainable, I would argue, uh, proteins on the planet, um, and a wider variety of beans and lentils, and a thoughtful variety of grains beyond rice and wheat. Um, if you look at that picture, what we have is farro and black-eyed peas with a little bit of, of color in there. Also a very successful um, dish. What if seasonal fruit platters didn't always look the same? This one makes me nuts. There isn't a catering um, opportunity um, where the same darn fruit platter and, might I say, cheese platter all looks the same. What if we appealed to the eaters who like bacon and cereal and vegetable and pizza and um, created this? for breakfast, um, or created this for another uh, meal in which we could give them forms of cereal and pizza and bacon. What if we adopted a goal of serving 100 different kinds of vegetable each year and 50 different varieties of fruit? It's entirely possible anywhere in the United States to do this. What if we developed a supply chain for delicious, ugly produce that might otherwise go to waste? When we think about reducing food waste, you know, the most salient idea out there for college campuses is don't use trays. Ah, that's been shown maybe to yield 2%. 2% not bad, but there are a lot of other creative ways of doing it, and I would argue that there's a heck of a lot more food waste. If the food tastes good, and I know that's a big assumption on a lot of college campuses, but if the food tastes good and the portions are right, then um, the real waste happens with trimming in the kitchen and in the supply chain before it even got to the kitchen. Let me just tell you what those examples are. On the left are number two avocados. If you're making guacamole, 
Who cares what the skin looks like? But these often go to waste because there isn't enough of a market for it. Because guacamole, or I should say avocados, the principal market is for um, uh, supermarkets. And they have to look nice, or they rot. Um, in the middle are number one and number two mushrooms. If you're chopping them up and frying them on a grill, um, who cares what they look like? They're all going to look the same in the end. Actually, number two typically means the little um, stem has been separated. Less work for the kitchen. I think it's a great idea. And in fact, we have done this by saying to our produce distributor, you can't sell us number ones. We're not going to take them. Sell them to other people. We want the number twos. By the way, it's also a little bit less expensive. So it typically works very nicely with any food service provider or any institutional uh, source that really wants to um, lower the cost and maybe spend the money on some other things that matter. On the far right are heirloom um, organic apples that are ugly and small, but they're not bruised. We knew we're, that we were going to have a problem selling this. And at Google, we don't actually sell food. We just give it away. An amazing perk. Any of you engineers out there, you might want to think about coming visiting us at some point. But if you cut in the middle, there's a funny sort of darker green core. So what we did was we put a little sign in front of them at the snack centers that said, these really ugly Pippin apples are delicious. They're organic, they're heirloom, they're California. Try them. Oh, and let, you, let us know what you think about them and whether it's OK if we put them here again. We didn't get a whole lot of response except for two things. The few people who did respond said, more, you know, give us more, give us more. The others just ate them up. There were absolutely none left. It's about marketing the specialness even if the product is ugly. So what if you required your food service provider to get at least six ugly products and local products on their contracted distributors' trucks? Now, when I say contracted distributors, one thing you've got to understand about food service companies is the way they are able to deliver value to institutions like UVM is to say we have contracted products and contracted distributors, and it's the lowest price you can possibly get out there. And there is truth to that. There isn't that much variety. I'm happy to talk about more details afterwards for those of you who are interested, but in working with them to work with their distributors, to work with their suppliers to get this on their trucks, it makes it easier for the chef because they don't have to deal with lots of other farmers coming at random times when they're in the middle of service, um, and you get the products you need. I say this from experience. I've done this all across the country, including New England. What about buying trim from their contracted meat and seafood distributors, starting with salmon bellies or with um, beef tips? Um, buying only smaller protein portion sizes from contracted meat suppliers. They have that option. They have a list of products they can buy. Let's talk about chicken. They come in about 12 different varieties, um, from 4 ounce to 5 ounce to 6 ounce to 8 ounce. You can help them specify what size you bring in and then guide students interest, um, and faculty lunches, by the way, um, to smaller portion sizes. And what if you challenge them to develop 25 different sauces using contracted canned tomatoes? I want to let you know that canned tomatoes, um, you probably know this, are mostly packed at the he height of the season. And they are really a very responsible option in the winter rather than hothouse tomatoes. And less processing for the kitchen, a very high quality product in many cases. Um, and if you really change the sauces, you can make most things pretty appealing. What if you required your food service provider to press for large scale change in production systems? 
such as taking responsibility for farm waste in exchange for buying products from them, not the farm waste, buying the chicken from them. Um, I was involved in a study that was published December 20th, 2013, and I bring that up because, yes, it was a Friday afternoon before Christmas. What a way to bury a report. Um, it didn't get the light of day, but I encourage you to look it up um, from the Pew Environmental Trust, and it was about the price of putting broilers on our, our kitchen tables. Um, but it really talks about the externalities of, um, especially the environmental externalities of uh, chicken um, uh, processing, um, really from a waste perspective. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of students question, why do we need these food service providers? And that's a complicated question. There are pros and cons of doing it in-house or having a third party. But one of the advantages you have in having a third party, because fundamentally there are only three big ones out there, is they have tremendous market power with some of those really big meat companies. They have more power than you do. It can be knocking your head against a brick wall sometimes, but I can tell you, unfortunately without any detail right now, that in four years we have worked with one of our one of the big chicken suppliers and really made a significant difference. They need a further kick um, to increase that percentage of their share. And that's something you can work with, I'm sure, with any of the food service providers that would be considered. And then what if you required your food service provider to take the first step in food system labor fairness by setting a code of conduct with food service employees on campus? Um, this is near and dear to my heart. I think we often think about farmers and farm workers, and that is appropriate. But what about the people who are serving up the food every day who are here at 6 in the morning? I think, you know, bringing them to farms to see where the food comes from and really working with them is critically important. Lastly, but maybe most importantly, what about teaching undergraduates how to cook from scratch? This is, after all, an educational institution. And if food literacy means a lot of things, but how to work with fresh fruits and vegetables. What are a greater variety of fresh fruits and vegetables than they're used to? This is critically important as a way to bring some value to the ladies in the kitchen excuse me, but that's who most of them are, and connect them to a lot of the students they see pass by them every day. Making that connection, I think, is a huge step forward, not first year, but a long-term strategy toward bringing about a more sustainable food system. So at Google, what we look at is the responsible business framework when we think about what products to bring in. Um, this is based on the work by Carol Sanford. He used to be a business school professor at San Jose State University. It's this pentad, if you will, of not saying consumers first or shareholders first, but looking at all of those um, needs, all of those interests. Um, what I like about this, co-creators is a term that isn't in normal parlance, so let me explain that a little bit. That's really the widest group of people. That includes the farmers, that includes the farm workers, that includes the suppliers and the distributors, and being fair to them and the food service providers, uh, everybody, and sort of looking, balancing those interests and making them a part of change, because that's how you drive change. Instead of saying, they're stupid, 
common, I feel that way sometimes, saying, okay, they're stupid, but what are their interests? How do we embrace them? How do we bring that along? Hugely important. And I think the other thing we need to think about, a little bit different in a um, college environment, but you could think about your investors, your shareholders, as the people of the state, as and, and, the, and your parents, and the people who are paying for the education and the facilities here. Um, they are investors in this whole process. They are shareholders. This isn't only about the lowest cost. It's about delivering a program that speaks to the values that are part of this community. Not having it double in cost is important, but not squishing down producers is also an important part of that value. So think about this, and when we think about those contradictions in supply chains, that maybe there needs to be a minimum standard at all of those as we learn more and encourage some of those producers to move on a path of further responsibility. So my take home messages are really to focus on the 80% making 80% of your food real. Reducing livestock-derived products is central to achieving a sustainable food system. And the only way to do this is by introducing variety and making other options really appealing. Think about the word vegetarian. It's changed in the last 10 years, but it hasn't changed enough. Most people assume um, a soy burger is what vegetarians eat, or that somehow they'd be interested in having tofu at every single meal. That is not the way the world's uh, vegetarians in India, in Africa, in most of East Asia eat. There's no reason why in North America we should be doing that either. Um, I also want to leave you with the idea that certifications don't always deliver the highest standard or the uh, most exclusive standard that you think they do. They don't embody all of the values that you care about, but they're important. Be flexible, though, in your approach. Think about the whole totality of the suppliers that you are working with. One thing I haven't said, but I want to caution you, and that is suppliers change over time. They get better, they get worse, they get both. We can't assume that a supplier we knew about five years ago or heard about in the media somehow hasn't changed. And I see this in California agriculture all the time. And then lastly, treating labor fairly is be best begun at home. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Helene.